So the doctrine of sin and redemption, I could call this the doctrines of hamartiology and soteriology. Hamartiology is the theological word for the study of sin. Soteriology is the theological word for the study of salvation from soter. I'm gonna give you a little bit of detail on those a little bit later. But to keep it simple, we're talking about the doctrines of sin and of redemption. What is wrong with us and what can we do about it? Okay, so. We start out here, the same place we ended up in our last session, and that is the question of what does it mean to be human? Those of you who were here in our last session, which was like six weeks ago, um, two weeks ago. <laughs> Come on, it's warm, I know, but you can laugh. Um, we studied theological anthropology, which means what does it mean to be human? And of course, we identified theological anthropology as the study of humanity, which is anthropology. But as it relates to God, that's the theological part. In other words, what does it mean to be human in light of a belief in God? Now, I start there today when we talk about sin and redemption because the, as we study the nature of humanity in light of God, we immediately take ourselves to the next point. Um, every culture, speaking from an anthropological point of view, every culture that has ever existed, as far as we can tell, has had some sense that there is wrong, something wrong with us. Okay, So a clear theological anthropology is necessary to give us an understanding of what it is that is wrong with us. The existence of sin and evil, the fall and redemption. Now the question of what is wrong with us, if every culture has always had a sense there's something broken in human beings, then Theological anthropology, Christian theological anthropology, tells us what that is. It tells us that humanity was made in the image of God, and we were created for a unique relationship with God, but we fell from that relationship. That relationship was broken because of disobedience and betrayal by our ancient ancestors. That gives us an explanation for what is wrong with us. Christianity has, and I've studied other religions a lot, you know, other philosophies a lot. In fact, I speak on cruise ships about other religions, you know, world religion specialists is what they call them. Okay. So I know a lot about what other religions say about these sorts of things. Christianity has by far the most sensible explanation for what's wrong with us. Now, Having established that, that there's something wrong with us, we identify that something as being a product of the fall. The fall is the event which is recorded in the book of Genesis, the third chapter, in which Adam and Eve, the first created persons that God made, and the ancestors of all the rest of humanity, betrayed the trust and love of God by violating the only rule that God gave them. God said, you know, put them literally in paradise the Garden of Eden, and said, I only have one rule for you. There's only one thing that I don't want you to do, and that is eat the fruit of that particular tree. Anything else you can do, it's all yours. Well, what did they do? What do children do when you tell them the one thing you can't do? Right? Well, they betrayed God. They betrayed his trust. They did the one thing they were told not to do. They ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And by thus defying and disobeying God, breaking his trust, the perfect relationship they had with God was broken, and Adam and Eve received just punishment for the betrayal. And that punishment included that first they became self-aware. I mean, they had a self-awareness anyway. Human beings were made as sentient creatures. Sentience means self-awareness. Aware of myself as a unique entity in the presence of and relationship with other unique entities. That's what sentience or self-awareness means. Well, Adam and Eve had that, but self-awareness became self-consciousness and shame and guilt when they sinned, broke the relationship with God. You'll remember the very first thing that happened in the story of the Garden of Eden in uh, chapter 3 of Genesis is they recognized they were naked and they took steps to try to cover themselves. Shame. Self-consciousness, not just self-awareness, but self-consciousness came in. There was no reason for people to blush before that. Also, reason was perverted. People became self-deluded. We no longer had clear rationality. Our rationality became something that, because it's broken, can take us in wrong directions. It's no longer a pure gift uh, that is in the image of God. We also experienced insecurity reflected in blame and accusation. What was the first thing that Adam said when God said, who told you you were naked? He says, this woman, it's her fault, and don't forget, you gave 
her to me. So the very first thing that Adam did was to blame both Eve and God for his own sin. This idea of throwing it back on God, which has continued to be a human tendency ever since then. So blame and accusation. It cannot be my fault, whatever happens. Then all human faculties and judgment, not only reason, became clouded. We no longer can see things clearly. All of the insecurity, all of the suspicion, the, the envy, the jealousy, all of those human emotions became broken so that they become uh, weapons that the devil uses against us because of the fall. Also, very plainly, uh, pain and death entered in the world, not just for Adam and Eve, but for all of creation. What was, the, what, was, what was the first thing God did for Adam and Eve after the first conversation in which he, they acknowledged what they'd done and, and he told them that they, you know, how terrible this was. What was the first thing God did? He covered them. Skin. He killed no, animals, animals to provide skins to cover them so they covered themselves with leaves. So death entered into the world, not just for Adam and Eve, but for other creatures as well that had not existed prior to that. And for all of humanity, this was not only physical death, which was introduced at that point, but spiritual death. Scripture talks about a first death and a second death. All people experience the first death, which means the separation of our soul from our physical body, when our physical bodies die. Scripture talks in Revelation also about a second death, which is the point at which you know, our souls are condemned if we are, not, if we are not in relationship with God through Jesus Christ. That's the second death. But the first death was introduced, and the potential for the second death introduced at that point. And evil, the very existence of evil, entered into the world at that time. Okay? I have a question. Yes. And you probably dealt with this in the angels and demons section last semester, but um, evil kind of was in the world, wasn't it, with the serpent? It was not in the world, but it, uh, but sin, there already had been um, a fall before Adam and Eve. Now, it wasn't in the world, it was in the spiritual realm, okay. but it wasn't in the world that Adam and Eve inhabited. And I'm going to get to that. Okay. Actually, the first sin, the first betrayal, was not Adam and Eve. It was Lucifer and the angels. Right. Right. And so you're correct about that, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. But in terms of the world that Adam and Eve occupied, the, you know, the physical world and their presence, it was their betrayal that introduced sin and death and evil to them. But there already had been a fall of the angels and condemnation for them because of that. Okay? Now this is the passage in Genesis that gives us this understanding. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say, so the first thing he did was he questioned whether or not we have a right understanding of what God said. Did God really say you must not eat, tree, eat from any tree in the garden? Which was not what God said. He only said one tree. So the devil is a liar right here. The one said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. Actually, we have no record of God saying you couldn't touch it, just that you couldn't eat fruit. So it may be that Eve is extrapolating a little bit in her explanation here. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So the temptation was that you can become like God in ways that God clearly had said was not to be available to them. <clears throat> when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he <laughs> ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. So Adam's just, I mean, Adam's supposed to be, you know, one in charge here. Um, he was God's first human creation, and yet he just goes along for the ride. Sure, honey, whatever you say. And yet it is Adam that is credited with the failing throughout the rest of the biblical history, not Eve. It doesn't say, well, Eve fell and she took Adam with him. It is Adam through whom sin came into the world. Okay, so this is the fall. Now, we need to say right up front that talking about sin in terms of sin being something that is broken in us is not popular. Humanity has, almost since the start, made excuses, right? The idea that there is something broken in us, there is something that is wrong in us, something that, that um, leads us to be prone to do evil, that we are not inherently good, people don't like that. 
That is contrary to what society wants to believe about themselves. An old friend of mine, um, Tim Waits, who became a Christian, but when he was, I knew him in college, he was really searching. He was visiting a bunch of different religious groups, the Baha'i Fellowship on campus and various others. And I was part of a Christian fellowship, and Tim was a roommate, and so he came to ours. He ended up becoming a Christian and a pastor later. But Tim said it beautifully. After he'd been to the Baha'i Fellowship, and the Baha'i uh, faith believes that all people are good, that you are good, and that all religions are equally correct, which is irrational, I'll just say it as a sidebar. We can't all be right. But Tim said something beautiful. He said, you know, they keep telling me that I'm good, that I'm basically good. But if I'm basically good, why is it so hard to be good and so easy to be bad? <laughs> right? We know that from our experience. Doing the good thing is often very difficult. Doing the bad thing is just, I mean, they grease that skin. You know, that's easy. That is the practical evidence of the fact that we are broken creatures. And that brokenness is sin. Now... Let's talk about the doctrine of sin and redemption in terms of what is sin. And here is where we get into, theologically speaking, the doctrine of hamartiology. Hamartiology, hamarta, uh, hamartia, excuse me. Hamartia is a Greek word that means to miss the mark. And it is a word that is most often used for sin. There actually are ten different words that get translated sin at various times in the Greek New Testament. But hamartia is the most common one. It means to miss the mark, like you're shooting at a target and you don't hit hit the, the bullseye. And it means the inability to measure up to God's moral standard. Missing the mark means you don't, you don't, um, you don't meet God's expectations. You don't hit the mark He has set for us in terms of His standards. A definition for sin is anything in a creature which does not express or which is contrary to the holy character of the Creator. We were made in the image of God. Prior to the fall, Adam and Eve would, were inclined to be like God, you know, in terms of good and righteous and consistent with His will. But they made a choice, and that choice took them in the wrong direction. Now, an important distinction we want to make here is between sin, with a capital S, and sins. Sin, with a capital S, is our spirit of rebellion against God, which is placed in us as part of our humanity. This is what is broken in people, in us. It is inherited or imputed from our ancestors, Adam and Eve. Sort of the plague of sin. The best description of this is that it is a contagious uh, plague that our ancient ancestors contracted and have passed down to every generation since then. That's what the word imputed means. That it has been given to us from them. Now, as opposed to sin with a capital S, sins are the acts we commit when we reflect the, spirit, the sinful nature that is in us. You know, we commit sins because we are infected with the sin principle, the plague of sin. John Calvin differentiated these by talking about sin as the thing that's wrong with us and the fruit of sin as the things we do because of what's wrong with us. You get that difference? So sin is the disease. Sins are the symptoms of the disease, which means the bad things we do because of it. Another way to say this is we are not sinners because we commit sins. We commit sins because we are sinners. We are people who, are, who have contracted from our ancestors this disease of original sin. Now this is the doctrine of original sin, which I'm going to get into a little bit more. Um, when we, when, in a few minutes we talk about Adam and Eve some more. Um, two verses. Psalm 51 says, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. In other words, it wasn't... I didn't have to get out of the womb and start moving around doing bad stuff before I was sinful. There was something already in me when I was conceived, before I had an opportunity to say or do anything. I had sin. And Jeremiah 17, 9, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Inherently deceitful. We are broken from before the time we are born. That is the doctrine of original sin. I'm going to come back to that in a couple minutes. But I want to address the question first that, that Carolyn had raised, and that is um, that sin began with the pride and fall of Satan in the angelic realm. Satan, shaitan, Hebrew, uh, which means the adversary, literally the enemy, was an angel. He was Lucifer. And we think Lucifer is, you know, is a very bad word. You know, Lucifer's mean. Lucifer means light. Lucis, right? Uh, Lucifer was the angel of light. 
tradition, his, you know, traditionally, the most beautiful of all the angels, associated with the planet Venus, the morning star, the brightest of all the planets. You know, sometimes you can mistake, uh, you know, mistake Venus for a, a very bright star because it's the brightest of the planets in the heavens. So, Isaiah 14 says, How you have fallen from heaven, O morning star. Venus is called the morning star because it comes up before the sun does. All right? Certain times of year, Venus will be above the horizon, in between the moon and the horizon. It's called the morning star, even though it's not a star, it's a planet. That's that connection, that link, traditionally, between Venus, the morning star, and Satan, Lucifer. How you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn. That is, coming up before the sun comes up. You have been cast down to the earth, you, uh, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mountain of assembly, on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high, the pride of, of the devil, wanting to be like God. Better to, you know, better to reign in hell than serve in heaven, to quote Faustus. Okay? But you are brought down to the grave, to the depths of the pit. It was apparently pride, not wanting to be second, that led Lucifer, the most beautiful of all the angels, to compete with God, to challenge God. And one-third of the angels went with him, according to tradition. All right? Actually, it says one-third of the stars, the dragon swept his tail, and one-third of the stars were swept from the sky, which is a, a metaphor for the fall of one-third of the angels. From Jude 6 and 7, and the angels who did not keep their positions of authority but abandoned their own home, these he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. And 2 Peter 2, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them into gloomy dungeons to be held for judgment, he goes on and says, He will not also not overlook our sins, is where the rest of that goes. But Scripture does not say a lot, as I talked about in the, our class on and the supernatural, where we talk about angels and demons, it does not tell us a lot about this. It tells us enough, though, to know that the angels, led by Lucifer, the morning star, did rebel against God before humanity fell. How do we know that? Because it was a fallen angel, the devil, in the form of a serpent that tempted humanity to fall. So this happened very early on in the whole creation of the universe process. Um, there... Uh, Apparently, and I, I don't know, don't remember I got into this in the angels and demons stuff, but apparently there is no salvation available to the angels who fell. For humanity, Jesus died on our behalf and gives us an opportunity, and theologians have tended to say the reason for that is, to some extent, we are all ignorant. You know, we, we're born into this, we have original sin, and even in our sinful actions, Things are clouded. I, I see through a glass darkly, later face to face, right? We don't really know what we're doing half the time. The angels knew exactly what they were doing. They were in the presence of God. They had a perfect knowledge of what God's desire for them was, and they still chose to rebel against Him. And so redemption is not available to them. Those who are being held in, you know, in chains until the final judgment day, and they will be cast into hell, and hell was not made for people. Hell was made for the, for the angels. In Matthew 25, Jesus said, Depart from me, you are cursed into the lake of fire, prepared for the devil and his demons. Hell was made for the devil and his demons. And the only reason that people go there is because if we reject God and ultimately say we don't want to be in the presence of God, there will be only one place where the presence of God is not manifest. And that will be in hell with the devil and his demons. Okay? All right. Here in the end of the sermon. <laughs> um, so, the first of the parts aspect of the fall was Satan and his demons. But then, our big concern is, what happened to us? Um, Before so that, I go on, can I ask a question? Sure. Um, I'm really having a problem with sin and its origin. Mm -hmm. um, did God create sin uh, through... His magnificence, being able to create all things mm -hmm. and look after all things. Right. And because he gave us a choice, it was part of his plan to incorporate sin and therefore big choices into, mm -hmm. into our reality. God did not create sin. God created a world in which sin was possible 
by giving us free will. Very simply, if, if, you, if someone doesn't have any choice as to whether or not they're going to love you, then they don't really love you. They're just, you know, they're just being forced to reflect something. The only way, since God made us in His image to be in relationship with Him, the only way it could be a real relationship was if we had the power to choose for it or to choose against it. So God gave us that ability of free choice, just like He did the angels, apparently. Um, but our most ancient ancestors betrayed God. They refused His love uh, by, by violating the only very minor rule that, they, that He gave them. And, and it, some, some theologians have said the very reason that there was that one restriction is that there needed to be some boundary in order for us for there really to be free will, in order for us really to be able to choose for God. So God did not introduce evil and sin into the world. He created a world which had free choice from his primary creatures, us, and we chose wrongly, and then sin and evil entered into the world. Okay? Now, there is a mis... You know, God is an all-knowing God. He knows everything. He's all-powerful. He do does everything. There is a mystery as to how an all-powerful and all-knowing God could create a world and then not have intended for that to happen. All right? The, for me, um, this goes back to the kenosis passage. And I think I've talked to you all about this before, but it doesn't hurt. The idea that when Jesus became human, he set aside part of his divine power. He didn't stop being God, but he set aside some of his power in order to be able to be fully human on our behalf, for our sakes. Well, in the same way, right before the, you know, the, uh, or right after the passage I read from the Garden of Eden in chapter 3, it says, And the Lord God was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and he called out, Where are you? Okay, now an all-powerful and all-knowing God would not have to ask, Where are you? Unless God had, out of respect and love for the relationship he had with Adam and Eve, he chose not to use his sort of omnipotent binoculars to be able to see everything. Now again, I believe that's not inconsistent with the nature of God because we have the passage in the New Testament that that's exactly what the Son of God did when he became incarnate. That he, he, uh, he saw his, his divinity as something not to be grasped, but rather set it aside for our sakes. And so I perceive that that passage in the garden where God intentionally did not use all of his power, it doesn't mean he didn't have it, it doesn't mean he stopped being fully God, but he did not use all of his authority or power and gave out of respect for us. And then, when he chose not to be looking over our shoulder, we violated his love for us. Uh, could it also be that when he said, where are you, could it, uh, it also have been, where are you in relationship to me? Well, yeah, except um, it doesn't really fit the context because when they do sort of pop up out of the bushes, he says next, who told you you were naked? That's the next line. Which again, he may, you could say, well, he's asking those questions rhetorically because he wants them to confess their sins. But it seems consistent to me, and it helps explain how, how they could have made that choice when an all-powerful and all-seeing God you know, would let them do that, without attributing evil to God. You know, the book of James says God does not, you know, is not tempted by evil and does not tempt other people to evil. So God was not responsible for causing them to do that. We can never throw, we can never throw this back on God and say, hey, you made me like this, it's your fault I did that. Okay, it wasn't my fault I shot that person. Yes, it was. Okay, and so, but there are mysteries in that. Okay, Marvin? Well, the Lamb of God was slain before the foundation of the world, so God was not surprised mm -hmm. when Adam and Eve did what they did. Yeah. He, he knew. Right, he's never surprised. But again, to me, it seems consistent with the character of God and helps me understand how all that could have happened. Now let's talk about what did happen to humanity, how sin came to us, and it did come to us. Scripture is very clear that original sin came to us through the sin of Adam. Romans 5, 12 to 13, and then 15 to 19. Paul writes, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man... Is Adam. Notice it doesn't blame Eve here. She gets a pass. Sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, that's where death entered the world. And in this way, death came to all men because all sin, in other words, we are all in Adam in his sin, as, as we inherited that sinfulness. We are guilty too. 
For before the law was given, sin was in the world. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if many died by the trespass of the one man, Adam, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? So sin and death came through Adam. The redemption of that came through Jesus Christ. The second Adam, he's sometimes called. Again, the gift of God is not like the result of the one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of one man death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Adam and Jesus are the bookends on the human experience. Adam introduced sin into the world and death into the world by his rebellion against God's will. Jesus Christ brought the healing for that. Consequently, just as the result of one trespass, he keeps talking about this, one man, one sin, death came in, one trespass, that's Adam, was condemnation for all men. We all were condemned because of that. So also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all men. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, this is the doctrine of original sin, so also through the disobedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. Okay, is that clear? Paul repeats himself over and over. He hammers the point because he wants to make sure you get it. Fundamentally, the sin of Adam brought death into the world, and we all inherited sin because of that first trespass. And it is the second Adam, as he's called in places, Jesus, who then heals us from the consequences of that as we will receive him. Clear? Now, I'll give you a little bit of history of the doctrine of original sin. Um, it seems pretty clear. And yet, <coughs> throughout history, the earliest of the, the church fathers didn't really deal with the issue of original sin. Um, there are a number of things which seem like such big deals to us, like the issue of election, etc., which the early church didn't see as problems. They didn't have a problem with it. The idea of original sin didn't actually get articulated until late in the second century, that is, late in the 100s, so over 100 years after Jesus' death and resurrection. Uh, Irenaeus, the Bishop of Lyon in France, was the first one to really do any sort of comprehensive study of original sin and to articulate what original sin meant. We, we then had Tertullian, Cyprian, uh, Ambrose, various other, others of the early church fathers write on this issue. But the ultimate one, you know, the super saint, Augustine, all right? Half of, half of anything that we get right, we can trace back to Augustine, all right? Not only as a theologian, but as a philosopher as well. Um, Augustine was born in the middle of the 4th century, lived into the 5th century. He was there at the fall of Rome. Um, and his, in fact, his book, The City of God, was written in order to try to convince people that Rome having fallen to the barbarians did not mean that, that the world was coming to an end, that God still had a plan. Okay. Um, so Augustine, in late in the 4th century, he really more, more specifically addresses the issue of original sin and he's the one that most clearly articulates early on that all humanity shares in Adam's original sin and that it is transmitted like a plague, again that's my word, but transmitted by human generation. You know, as babies are born, they carry with them that original sin. Uh, he referred to it as inherited sin or uh, hereditary guilt is another expression. That in Adam all were present Augustine said, and so all sin. We are all, I mean, all of us, are in some way present in all of our immediate ancestors, all of our, all of our ancestors. Now, somewhere in the, in the DNA of my parents and my grandparents and my great-grandparents and my great-great-grandparents and all the way back, somewhere in their genetic makeup, I was there. Because it's some combination of that that led to me, or to you in your case. And because of that transmission, I was present, quite literally, as Augustine said, we were all present in Adam, and so all sin. We all carry that sinfulness. He talked about it as concupiscent, concupiscence, meaning that we have a, 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 guilt, a, a guilty thinking, you know, that we, we have a, a, a bad attitude, quite literally, you know, that there is in us something that is twisted and wrong, that we are bent. Uh, and that we inherited that bentness from our ancient ancestors. 
Now, uh, early in the church, there was difficulty in accepting what Augustine had had to say, and there's a reason for that. Because from the second century on, um, there was a huge problem Christians were facing with the, the Gnostics. We all know about Gnosticism, right? Uh, Paul and others in the New Testament were writing to a, a nascent or an early Gnosticism. But later on, Gnosticism became a major challenge to Christianity. And because Gnosticism doesn't like the physical body, doesn't like the physical world, they believe the spiritual is all that matters, the, the Gnostics were preaching that all human beings in their physical sense were depraved and that all human nature, the human flesh, is therefore <coughs> sinful. Which sounds a whole lot like original sin, although they didn't mean it that way. Their whole orientation was not because Adam had sinned and we inherited it, but rather because all physical matter is evil. Well, because the Augustine's doctrine of original sin could sound like Gnosticism, many Christians were reluctant to accept it, because it sounded like we were playing to the, to the enemy when we said that. But again, the source is very different. It actually is a very different thing. It just sounded similar. Um, Augustine also was reacting against a, a, a fellow named Pelagius. Pelagius and his the doctrine he followed or that he created called Pelagianism said that human beings were not victims of original sin and we did not inherit Adam's sin, but rather that Adam just simply set a bad example. Literally, I'm not. That's what he said. Adam set a bad example, and because Adam set a bad example. Human beings had a tendency to follow that example, but Pelagius said we have complete ability and authority to choose a holy, good, and moral life, apart from anything God does. That human beings can choose the right. Augustine said, no, we're broken, and we can't heal ourselves. And Augustine's line comes on down, and we'll talk about the reformers in a second. But Pelagius' idea that, that uh, Adam just set a bad example and that we tend to follow that example, but we don't have to. We can make our own choices. Later, I mean, he was, he was condemned by the church pretty soundly, and yet Pelagianism continued. Later on, even those that were part of the church began to follow what was called uh, semi-Pelagianism, which meant that Adam's sin was real, and that his sin didn't just set a bad example, but actually inclined us to do evil. It prompted us. There was an actual effect on us not just an example, for us to do evil, but that we still could overcome that and choose good if we wanted. Well, semi-Pelagianism, which lasted a lot longer than Pelagianism, still the church eventually rejected. Okay? So this is kind of the doctrine that brings us up to, uh, you know, that, that introduces for us the idea of original sin as a doctrine. Then um, Pelagius was condemned, but they didn't completely affirm Augustine early on in the 5th and 6th century because they thought it sounds too much like Gnosticism. In the 11th century, Anselm of Canterbury, the Bishop of Canterbury, comes along and he defines original sin as, and I quote, a privation of righteousness that every man, um, every man is prone to possess. Meaning, it wasn't that we have something actively bad in us, it's that we have the absence of good in us. We are deprived of righteousness. So he's trying to put a positive twist on the thing. And Anselm was very influential. And he's, he carried from the 11th century pretty much up into the Reformation in the 16th century. So for 500 years, Anselm's idea that we were just deprived of righteousness, that the, there was good absent, not bad present, right? The Reformers come along, Luther, Calvin, and all of the others, they completely reject Pelagianism. They affirm Augustine in his doctrine that human beings inherited Adam's guilt and that we are sinful from the point of our conception and that we are incapable by ourselves, by our own efforts of making ourselves good or choosing the good. That's why they rejected Pelagius. Um, both Luther and Calvin, even though Calvin's the one who gets smacked around for this, advocated total depravity of the human condition, which means that human beings are completely alienated because of original sin from God and have a total inability to actively uh, achieve, to do anything of our own effort to achieve reconciliation to God, it is entirely an act of grace on his behalf, on, on God's behalf. God does it for us because we are so broken we can't fix ourselves, right? Which is very much what Augustine said. Augustine advocated a kind of total depravity. Um, so you get a sense of the bouncing around. 
in terms of the doctrine. But from the Reformation on, there's been a quite consistent doctrine of belief within Protestantism that it is entirely the grace of God that saves us. Right? And we'll talk about that a little bit, uh, a little bit more later. I'll give you a couple of other things that are where Paul in Romans talks about the fact that we are all victims of original sin. We all fell from grace and Adam. From uh, Romans 3, 9 to 12, we have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under sin. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. No one, uh, there is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Sounds like original sin. We are too broken to fix ourselves. None of us are righteous in any way. We, have, we are worthless with regard to our ability to reach God. And then from Romans 3.23, I didn't do 24 here, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Both we, we have sin at the point of conception and we do sin from our earliest age. I mean, what's the earliest you've ever known a kid do something mean? <laughs> One and a half, okay? Um, doesn't take long before we start adding our own sins to whatever original sin is present in us, okay? Carolyn. So, um, I think in Romans that there's no, no one righteous, not even when it's from Isaiah or something, right? Um, yes, he's quoting there, yes. Um, so, do the Jews believe in original sin? They do not. Um, the Jews believe very much more a Catholic kind of doctrine that, that, yeah, we may be prone to evil, but we have a choice. I mean, mm -hmm. the Jews are Pelagians, mm -hmm. pretty much. That, yeah, we may be, because of Adam, the fall of Adam, of course, that's in Genesis. That's part of the, the law. That we, we are stained, we are inclined toward evil, but we have a choice to, to choose good. So even in Jesus' time, they wouldn't have had the same kind of concept. They would not have related to that in the same way. You know, this is why we rely so heavily on Paul and why we believe Paul was inspired by God to help us understand all of this because it was Paul primarily. John and others, I mean, it's elsewhere in the New Testament, really did give us an understanding of... of and they're getting it from the Old Testament, but but yeah. it just hadn't been put together. In exactly. It had, not, it had not been crafted that way. Um, so, the, our Christian belief says that for all of our sinfulness, we're not... There is a light at the end of the tunnel. There is something for us, and that is that our sins can be forgiven by the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. Here's where we shift from the study of sin part into the salvation part, from the hamartiology to the soteriology. The belief that Jesus, who was the very Son of God, came to earth, was incarnate, and then sacrificed himself to provide atonement. The word atonement, a theological word which means to be reconciled to God, um, hundred years ago, I remember reading, somebody said the way to remember what atonement means is it's at one moment. It means reconciled to God, that we become one with God, you know, that we join with God again, the at one moment, the atonement, the reconciling to God that Jesus makes available to us. Very simply, the formula is, we sin, we, we are sinful. God's holiness and his justice demanded that a price be paid for that sin. And I'm going to talk about the various ways this has been articulated. But God's holiness and justice demanded a price be paid for our sin against him, because any sin is, a, is an affront to God. But that's God's holiness and justice. But God also is a God of love, and God's love caused him to provide the price for us, to pay the price for us, to have Jesus sacrifice himself for us, to provide the necessary payment for our sin. Okay. That's, the, that's the link there. So... There we get into the doctrine of salvation or soteriology. The word soteriology comes from uh, the Greek word sotor, which means uh, savior, and then logos, which means word. So it is, it, there are words about salvation or about, about the savior. Uh, what is Christian salvation? It means the saving of the soul from sin and from its consequences, especially the means by which a person is forgiven of sin and reconciled to God. We use the words deliverance or redemption, or as I said, atonement. All of those words are sort of used interchangeably. They may have technically, theologically technical, slight differences, but they mean the same thing. How do we overcome the sinfulness that is in us? By atonement, deliverance, redemption, salvation. Now, Christian soteriology examines how an individual is miraculously saved by divine grace through faith in Jesus Christ, who sacrificed himself on the cross to pay the price for our sins, so that we might be reconciled to God. 
That's what Christian soteriology, Christian salvation is all about. Ephesians 2, 8 to 10. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. God does it for us. We don't do it for ourselves. We cannot pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. So there's several concepts there that the world doesn't like. One, we're broken. And because of our brokenness, we are lost and condemned. The world doesn't like any of that. And because we are lost and condemned, we cannot improve ourselves. We are so lost and so condemned, we cannot pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. I cannot make me better. I can't make myself good enough to be acceptable to God. And so therefore, I have to, in all humility, rely entirely upon what God has done for me, His grace. Several, and, and that involved Jesus shedding His blood on the cross, because uh, Hebrews 9.22 says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. In the Old Testament, of course, the Hebrew people were given as a special grace from God, the ability to sacrifice animals, to shed the blood of animals, to cover their sins, to, to have their sins forgiven. But the animals had to be as perfect as they could be, you know, as spotless on the outside. But still they were perfect. And so therefore, as more sins were committed, more animals had to be sacrificed. And um, I don't remember if I've done it in here or I preached on this recently during Lent. Um, some people will say, you know, the Old Testament is so awful. It's all of this animals being killed and blood. It's just horrible. That was the point. The sin of the people was so horrible, our sin is so horrible, that only something which was horrible could make us aware of the severity of our crimes against God and therefore provide for the remission of those sins. The sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, His suffering, His gruesome death. I preached a series of sermons, which are available online if you want to hear them during Lent. And in which I, I said, well, why, did, why couldn't Jesus have a, a quick death? Why couldn't they just behead it really quickly? Why did he have to suffer? Why did it have to be so horrible? Because only in recalling the horror of that are we fully aware of just how awful our sin was and the price that had to be paid for that. For the Hebrews in the Old Testament, the number of animals that had to be killed, the fact their blood had to be spilled, that that blood had to be spread around on the altar, that's such a horrible thing, is exactly the point. Leviticus 17 says, you know, I mentioned Hebrews 9, without the shedding of blood there's no remission of sin. Hebrews 17, 11 says, it is the blood that makes an atonement for the soul. And Jesus was the perfect sacrifice. The imperfect sacrifices of the Old Testament didn't last. They had to be repeated over and over again. But when a perfect sacrifice was available, that one perfect sacrifice, the Son of God Himself, who was without sin, was sufficient to cover all sins for all time. Matthew 20, 28 says, The Son of Man came not to be ministered to, but to minister and to give His life as a ransom for many. He paid the price. He ransomed us from our sin. Okay? Any questions about that? What was that text in Leviticus? Leviticus 17, 11. And the Matthew one? The Matthew one is 20, 28. And the Hebrews one, which talks about there is no, that without shedding of blood, no remission of sin, is Hebrews 9.22. Okay? I want to get into some of the Christian theories of salvation because there have been different interpretations of exactly how this sacrifice of Christ, what happened when Jesus died on a cross for us. But in order to not have a break in the middle of this, because this will be a little bit, why don't we go ahead and take our break right now? Uh, all right, let's start back. Um, we've already prayed, so we're good. I want to talk now, there are at least five different theories of salvation that the church has advocated at various times and with various champions. When I say theories of salvation, what I mean is, all of these would say that Jesus provided an atoning act for us. But exactly what happened there when he provided atonement for us? And so there are different understandings of that. And I want to talk about these five ending up with the one that is the one that the reformers established and that is the common one in Protestantism today. And I'll talk very briefly about what Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy say, which is a slightly different uh, approach to it. The first and probably the oldest of the theories of salvation, and this was popular in the first three centuries, 
um, is the, the theory of moral transformation. The idea was that a person is saved from sinfulness by following the teaching of Jesus and the example that he set about how to live. In other words, if we become more like Jesus, we will be transformed morally and therefore will we'll overcome our sinfulness. When was this? First three centuries. After, after around 350 or so, in the fourth century, and, and which, by the way, is when Augustine comes on the scene, this idea of moral transformation faded away. And again, you will remember that, that for the most part, I'm, the whole doctrine of soteriology of salvation, both of, of homardiology and soteriology, were not major themes with the earliest of the church fathers. This came along later. Well, they just sort of had kind of a general, well, if, you know, if we believe Jesus is the Son of God, and we sort of follow Him and act like Him, then, you know, then we'll be good. This still is um, somewhat present today by some of the Orthodox, especially, I think, the Oriental Orthodox churches. I won't get into that, but Orthodoxy has got a lot of different, a lot of different faces. Eastern Orthodoxy are the major ones you know about, Russian Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, etc. There's also a group of churches that are Oriental Orthodox, which include the, um, the Ethiopian Orthodox and Indian Orthodox and some others. But some of them, especially in the Oriental Orthodox, still will maintain this as kind of a doctrine. And in fact, this is present in people who don't know any better today. Well, if we're all, you know, Jesus was a really good man, and if we were all or more like him, the world would be fine. That's a perversion of this one. And that is not what we believe, because that clearly is not what Paul believed. That's not what the New Testament teaches. It was sort of just almost without an effort, this is what early Christians kind of thought. So that's one. That's not what we believe. Second is the theory of the Christus Victor. This is a belief that Jesus achieved salvation for us by defeating our spiritual enemies, especially by defeating Satan. This sort of, this developed after the moral transformation sort of thing. The idea was that when Jesus died, he and the devil had this massive arm wrestling match in which Jesus came out the victor, and in, in defeating Satan, he then also overcame death, um, which is, the devil is associated with death throughout the New Testament. Again, this is, this is not what we believe today. In fact, this never caught on very well in the West, that is, Western Christianity. This was more of a Greek kind of thought. Um, and it's not really popular today at all. But it was, historically speaking, this was one of the ideas, that Jesus saved us by defeating the devil. And so therefore the devil wasn't able to hurt us anymore and we're okay now. Right? Got that? The third theory was the ransom theory of atonement. The idea there is that um, Satan, because he's the ruler of the world, and because we are sinful creatures and therefore in his thrall, that he had power over people's souls in the afterlife, but that Jesus, similar to the Christus Victor, that Jesus um, overcame Satan. Now, there's several different versions of this. This, this sort of arose in the third century after the moral transformation idea fell out of vogue. But one of, one of the most popular versions of this ransom theory is that the devil had, a, had the right to claim the souls of sinners when they died. When Jesus died, because he was carrying our sins, the devil overextended himself. He overreached himself by trying to claim Jesus' soul. But since Jesus himself had never sinned, the devil was defeated in that effort and therefore fell from power. Okay, that's, so the devil wasn't able to accomplish claiming Jesus' soul. In the process, he lost all of his power over the souls of all people, right? Another version of it is that God gave Jesus to the devil in return for everybody else's souls. But then because Jesus was the son of, son of God and not himself sinful, he was raised from the dead. He was resurrected. In doing so, the devil was left with nothing. Not with our souls that were won by the transfer of Jesus, nor by Jesus himself. Okay, I'm not suggesting these are, these are not what we believe. But you need to understand, every once in a while you'll get a little smattering of this in things that you hear today. There are still Christians who've got screwy ideas, you know, and certainly unorthodox. Unorthodox is a more technical term than screwy idea. 
<laughs> and some of these things might get reflected, and you need to know that at various times in history, and sometimes it's a difference between Eastern perspective, perspectives and Western perspectives. Yes, Art. Uh, this idea is still around very much today. I, if you work with unbelievers, you know how much they have a mixture of a little bit of Christianity and a little bit of this. Exactly. And uh, it's terrible because it is so ingrained in them that it makes the work so much more difficult. Right, and that's the reason why, because these are our historical understandings of soteriology, of how salvation happens, I want you to hear them and to understand this is not what we believe. Okay, because otherwise you won't be able as easily to distinguish that sort of thing. Um, you do get pieces of this. The moral transformation is a secular idea today. Well, Jesus was a good man. If we all were more like him, if we acted more like him, you know, he was a really good guy, then we'd all be fine. That's not Christianity in any orthodox sense of it. And when I say orthodox, I don't mean Eastern Orthodox. I mean right belief, the meaning of the word orthodox, right belief. Okay? So the fourth version, which came along with Anselm of Canterbury in the 11th century, is the satisfaction theory of atonement. The belief that people needed salvation from divine punishment. We had offended God, and we rightfully would be punished. We deserved a punishment for our sins. But it was perceived as being sort of a slight to God's honor. Anselm, in the 11th century, he presented God sort of like a feudal lord whose honor had been offended. You know, back in those days, people had draw their sword if somebody, if somebody offended their honor. Well, Anselm presented God sort of like that, a feudal lord whose honor had been offended and who therefore was going to claim his rightful you know, judgment against humanity for having offended his honor. And that Jesus' atonement satisfied the offense that our sin caused to God's honor and therefore did away with the need for God to punish us. It was very much an honor of God being satisfied kind of thing. That's why it's called the satisfaction theory of atonement. Um, that was popular from the 11th century to the 16th century, the 1500s, when the right idea finally came out, as we would believe, and that is the, the concept of penal substitution. This came about from the 16th century reformers, Luther, Calvin, others. They reinterpreted Anselm's uh, satisfaction theory not from an honor offense kind of paradigm, but rather to a legal paradigm. That uh, God's righteousness had been offended legally, and therefore human sin demanded punishment. Crime had been committed against the, against the righteous will of God, and so a punishment was required. That's why it's called penal substitution. Penal meaning penalty, punishment. You know, our prisons are called the penal system. That's where people are held as a penalty for their having committed crimes. So the idea was that our offenses broke God's law. They offended God in a legal way, not, not in an honor way, as uh, Anselm had said. And so therefore, a payment had to be made. Punishment is necessary for commission of a crime. And yet, and then that's, as I said earlier, God in his holiness and righteousness demanded that some penalty be paid for the crime of our sins against him. And yet, God is also a loving God, and so in his love, he provided the payment himself, rather than requiring it of us. So that Jesus Christ, on the cross, died in our place, shed his blood, so we didn't have to, in order to save us from God's wrath. And people who don't like to think about God's wrath, get over it. God does have righteous wrath. It's not like us being mad or angry, because our anger is always tainted by our own selfishness. That is not so for God. God's wrath is righteous. But this is penal substitution by faith, which means we have to have faith that Jesus really did this for us. If you confess with your mouth, Paul said, that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. So again, all of this goes back to Scripture. This is not just something that the Reformers made up. For the last uh, 500 years, Protestantism has, has agreed that penal substitution is the best way of describing the way in which salvation works. Our sin... <coughs> 
was a crime against God. That crime required punishment. God had a right to claim our blood. As I said in the sermon recently, God gave us our breath. And when we sinned, when we violated his faith and trust in us, he had a right to take our breath back. He gave us our blood. He had a right to take our blood back. But in his love, he decided that he would make other arrangements so we didn't have to pay that price, that, that penalty, that penal. And that, so there was a substitution. Jesus died in our place. Okay? Penal substitution is the standard Protestant way of viewing how salvation worked, what Jesus did for us, and how that satisfied the demands of God so that we could be reconciled, atone, the atonement to bring us back in reconciliation with God. Is that clear? Okay, and, and again, all of the verses that I've used, it's not, all of them are consistent with this, whereas there's other things, like the whole moral transformation clearly is not what the New Testament um, would present to us. Now, two other slightly different views. Roman Catholicism does not view humanity as totally depraved, in other words, unable to help ourselves, but rather... The Catholic doctrine is that we are wounded by sin. Not that we are completely um, unable to help ourselves, but we're simply lessened or wounded by sin. And so the Catholic belief is that we are saved by Christ's atoning act on the cross, plus the grace that is given through the church, through the sacraments. The Catholic belief is that you must res you receive grace, in other words, the application of that grace to your life that Jesus made available, comes through the church, and it is received by the sacraments of the church. You receive grace by participating in the sacraments, the sacrament of communion, of baptism, of confession, etc., all seven of them. All right? So there's a difference there. The Roman Catholic belief is that human beings have a responsibility to do something to, in order to be saved, in order to be able to access the grace that Jesus made available. That's different than the Protestant belief, where we are entirely recipients. We don't do anything actively to receive it, okay? Eastern Orthodox churches, uh, very different. In fact, the, you know, you're from the Eastern tradition. The Orthodox, the Eastern Orthodox churches, uh, when I say that, I mean all of the, um, the Greek tradition, all of the, all of the Eastern churches. Um, they don't focus on a legalistic, like penal substitution, because the Eastern churches have a very different perspective about this whole thing. Eastern churches have tended much more to speak, not in legalistic terms, but in medical terms. In other words, the idea is that we suffer from a spiritual sickness. And Jesus, as the great physician, provides a healing for that spiritual sickness. It's a very different kind of orientation. Uh, the Eastern churches have a very different way of thinking. Theirs is a much more spiritual, meditative kind of orientation toward the faith, which is why they've never had serious problems with, with uh, liberal theology creating controversy. You know, they don't have a big heresy problem because they're not concerned about rationalistic or legalistic approaches so much as spiritual approaches, for which the, the sort of spiritual sickness kind of thing fits into that. Okay? Is that a fair representation? Very fair. Okay. Um, so you see that there is a, there's sort of a different approach. But the idea of penal substitution is the basic Protestant doctrine that is held since the Reformation because it was, it was agreed to by all of the reformers, by Luther, Singley, Calvin, all of them agreed that this is the fundamental understanding of how it is that Jesus' act for us on the cross ends up saving us. All right? Questions about that? Chris. Um, okay, penal substitution, 1500 until now. Uh, clearly we're saved. But looking at the other theories, like, were they widespread? And did people who believe, say, in the satisfaction theory or the Christus Victor, even though they didn't understand it, I mean, I, I imagine they're still saved, even though they don't, you know. It, but it kind of seems like maybe they weren't. No, I think they were. I think what it was is that all of them um, were relying upon the act of Christ to save us, which is, you know, you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I think that was true for all of those people. Right. The issue of a, a theological understanding of exactly how all the pieces fit together on that, I don't think they had that right. But still, again, from Paul in Romans, confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Right. Even though their theology may not have been as clearly articulated. Some of it because some of these were fairly early and you know they had not really worked on it. 
You know, these were not the major issues. You know, they, for instance, early on in the church, the, the first ecumenical councils were focused almost entirely upon the Christological controversies. What was the nature of Jesus? They didn't get into issues like, you know, how is it that salvation gets applied to us by the act of Jesus? Yes? Okay. All right? We're good? All right. So we're talking about the, the reformers who all agreed that it is not human works that save us, but only God who acted on our behalf. Um, and he is the cause of our salvation. Human beings, in short, owed God something we could not pay. Nothing we could do could pay the price for our sin, so Christ paid it on our behalf. So the reformers talked in terms of the five sole, of the five sole of the Reformation. This is a shorthand explanation for what it is the reformers believe. The first, sola gratia which means uh, by grace alone. Not by works, by grace. Sola fide, by faith alone. Not because somebody else said, you know, you, you take communion and you therefore are saved. No, it is by God's grace that you accept by faith. By scripture alone. Based upon what we find in scripture. As Martin Luther said when he was, you know, before the emperor and, and the representatives from the pope, they were saying, you have to recant, you have to recant, you have to recant. And he kept saying, you show me in Scripture where I'm wrong, and I will recant. But until you do, here I stand, I can do no other. So that whole Scripture focus, in fact, that's why the study of Scripture, the whole biblical theology orientation, did not occur until the Reformation. Prior to the Reformation, all of the theology that was ever done was for 1,500 years had been, uh, well, not quite 1,500 years, since the real establishment of the, of the Bishop of Rome as the head of the, the Western Church, all of the, the biblical theology that was done was really dogmatic theology. It was in, to, to prove doctrinal stances of the Catholic Church. Then, through Christ alone, solus Christus. It is Christ alone who saves us. The Church does not save us. The Church is not involved in it. It is through Christ alone. And to the glory of God alone, not to the glory of the church or a pope or a priest or me, but to the glory of God alone. You put that all together, and it is that salvation is by faith alone, in Christ alone, through grace alone, for the glory of God alone, as told in Scripture alone. That is the Protestant Reformation. The Catholic Church would have disagreed with all of that. Not so much that grace, faith, Scripture, Christ, God but the alone part. The point of the Reformation is, I don't have to have the church, or the forgiveness of a priest, or the approval of a bishop, or the sacraments of the church. I am saved because I have faith in Christ, given to me by grace, to the glory of God, as found in Scripture. Period. And that's why the Reformation was the Reformation, why they reformed our understanding of what belief was. And all of this obviously relates to how it is we're saved. And it's a different understanding than the Catholic Church had up, you know, well, up till then and up till today. The two fundamental doctrinal differences between Roman Catholicism and Protestantism are how do you receive grace for salvation? The Catholic Church still maintains you can rec you receive it through the sacraments of the church. So the church has to be involved. All the way back to Origen. Origen said that you cannot have God as your father if you don't have the church as your mother. Protestantism does not believe that. We believe grace is directly accessible to us because of what Christ did for us without the intercession of any other body. And the second thing is on what we base our authority. Protestantism maintains our authority is found in Scripture. Excuse my office. I always look over here for it. The Bible. <laughs> you know, Scripture alone. Sola Scriptura. Whereas the church says that the magisterium, the leadership of the church down through the ages, is equal in authority to what Scripture says. It's both. Those are the two biggest doctrinal differences. Everything else is adiaphora. Everything else is kind of gray area. We may disagree with them, but they're not fundamental. The issue of how you receive grace into salvation and what is the authority for what we believe, those two are important. And there are differences. And I'm not, you guys hopefully know me well enough, no, I'm not thinking about the Catholic Church. But we do need to understand what we believe, and sometimes we can only clearly understand that when we do so in the context of what are not our beliefs. Okay, questions about that? John? Yeah, looking at this, um, 
and, and observing the current situation of the contemporary church, it would be proper to say maybe it's time for another reformation. Because in many circles it is not by grace alone. It is not by faith alone. It's not by scripture alone. It's not by Christ alone. It's not glory to God alone. And yet we are Protestants. But it, would, it would almost, you know, I, I could entertain the thought that maybe we need in the contemporary church another mm -hmm. reformation that reestablishes these. I don't mean I don't mean it's a formal thing. Sure. I mean we 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 often point our picture to the nemesis which drew up this thing, which is the Catholic Church. Which now, when you look, in many ways, we have become guilty of the very works of the mm -hmm. well, I think that's true. In fact, Art and I were talking about this in the break. Um, that all too many churches are are not doing this. I mean, I don't think we need a reformation because the reformation, it was necessary for them to correct wrong doctrine. In the Protestant faith, we believe now we have the right doctrine. The question is, are we doing it? Mm -hmm. Are we preaching it? Are we living it? So, I don't think we need another massive movement. We just need to reclaim exactly. That's what I is mean. true. And I think that has to be done at church at the time. That's what I mean. All right? I hope, correct me if I'm wrong, those of you who are part of our congregation, I hope that in our church we are preaching faith alone and Christ alone through grace alone as told in Scripture alone for the glory of God alone. I certainly am trying to communicate that. I hope you hear it in this. And my, com my comment is not No, 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 and I know. But, but my point is that has to be done one church at a time. We're trying to do in our church every other church, whoever the leadership is in that church, whether it be the pastor or, or the elders or the, you know, the lay committee or whoever else it is, the bishops, they have, that's their responsibility. I mean, that fundamentally is their job. This is what our faith is supposed to be about, we believe. Are we doing it? Every church has to claim that. When I, I wasn't being defensive when I said that about us, but I believe that and we're trying to do that. Um, so, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't disagree that too many churches, and that's what Art was saying, too many churches are, at, at the break, too many churches are simply not there anymore. And we need to reclaim that. And, and we're not there anymore because it's hard or because well, does, people, it fit, does it fit our society? People don't like it when you say those things, you know? People, they're afraid somebody might be offended. You know what? If somebody's offended when I preach, then I don't want to offend them. I mean, I'm not intending to offend them, but if they're offended, then I say, well, maybe the Holy Spirit's trying to tell you something. I preached a sermon recently, and I used an example. I did not know who the person was who had said something. They had said it to one of our elders. One of the elders told me, I didn't know I was, who I was talking about. I preached it, well this person just threw a fit at me after the service. I mean, really angry. And I said, I did not know that was you. And she said, she said, you did not represent me correctly, blah, blah, blah. I said, all I know is what I was told. And if that's not what you said, then maybe there was somebody else who needed to hear that, and that's why God inspired me to preach that sermon. If it wasn't you, fine. I said twice in the sermon, if this, if this isn't you, then cover your ears. Sing your favorite song to yourself, right? You guys are there, right? Remember when I did that? Um, but I'm left with a sense that if you're that offended by it, then maybe the Holy Spirit is trying to tell you something. So we need to not be afraid to offend people. I learned something very wonderful from, um, from Rick Warren in an article he wrote not too long ago, and he said, uh, sometimes the best thing possible is for somebody to stop coming to your church. Yep. Back to revival. Yeah, back to revival. You know, uh, sometimes with the health of the body, that's necessary. So the point is, we need to speak the truth. We need to do it in love, but we still need to speak the truth. There's that great story of the two 19th century preachers, and they'd always get together, and one of them said, so what did you preach last week? And he said, I preached that the, uh, that the sinner will be damned to hell. And after a pause, his friend said, and did you do it with love? <laughs> okay, sorry, getting off on all sorts of things. I want to spend a few minutes now and talk about how we receive this salvation. Particularly, is it by free will or is it by sovereign election? I'm not going to argue one side or the other for you. I'm a Reformed theologian, so you sort of know where I'm coming from. But I'm going to be fair here. I want to look at scripture verses which I believe the various, the, the, the Election versus free will people use, legitimately use, 
to defend their side so that hopefully we'll come away from this with greater understanding and greater humility as well. So let's talk about that. And I'm going to start with defense of free will as the way by which we access salvation. Okay? And I'm going to give you a number of verses. Romans, oh, well first, uh, the, these are not one at a time. I'm in for them. Well, that's all right. We can do it. Ezekiel 18. Go back to the Old Testament. Rid yourself of all the offenses you have committed and get a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, people of Israel? For I take no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Sovereign Lord. Repent and live. That sounds like somebody can decide to repent, to accept the Lord, that he does not want anybody to be condemned. Right? That sounds like free will. The second one, Mark 16, 15 to 17. He said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. It sounds like people can decide. Romans 10, 9 to 13. I just quoted this about four times a day. If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Sounds like you have a choice. Right? Now, of course, the, the Reformed theologians respond that this is all true, but it only happens if God calls you, you know, if you're one of the elect. But... Then, John 3.16, you know that one. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. I always think it's a shame that we stop there. Because it goes on to say, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. <coughs> believe you're saved. Sounds like there's a choice. 2 Corinthians 5.15, For he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. 1 Timothy 2, 3-5, This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Sounds like he wants everybody and you can choose. All right? Those are some of the verses that the free will folks will use. Well, what about the verses that the those who believe in sovereign election, that God has chosen before the creation of the world, who will be saved. Jeremiah 1 5, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. Before you were born, before you had any choice, God had set certain people apart. Philippians 2, therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation for, with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in, a court, in order to fulfill his good purpose. God is doing it in you. God motivates you to fulfill his purpose. Mark 4. When he was alone, the twelve and the others around him asked him about the parables. He told them, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to those on the outside, everything is said in parables, so that they may be ever seeing but never perceiving, ever hearing but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. That's Jesus. Ephesians 1, 3 to 6. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. He predestined us for adoption before the creation of the world. Okay? Romans 8, 28 to 30. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Again, we usually stop there. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he, might, that, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. These verses sound like God 
planned it before we had the ability to make a choice. 1 Corinthians 2, 7 and 8. No, we declare God's wisdom a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. Acts 13, 48. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord, and all who were appointed for eternal life believed. All who were appointed for eternal life. Ephesians 2, 8 to 10. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, for this is not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast. We usually stop there. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do, to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. All of this is a fulfillment of God's planning. And the one that really sort of kicks booty for me is Romans 9, 14 to 25, which apparently is written exactly in response to the question as to, well, but if God elected people, then how's that fair? Paul writes, what then shall we say? Is God unjust? Not at all. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. It does not, therefore, depend on human desire or effort, but on God's mercy. For Scripture says to Pharaoh, uh, says to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this very purpose, that I might display my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Therefore, God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy, and he hardens whom he wants to harden. One of you will say to me, then... Why does God still blame us, right, if we don't have a choice? Why does God still blame us? For who is able to resist his will? But who are you, a human being, to talk back to God? This sounds like Job, by the way. Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for special purposes and some for common use? What if God, although choosing to show his wrath and make his power known, bore with great patience the objects of his wrath, prepared for destruction? We are all prepared for destruction. We were born as sinners. What if he did this to make the riches of his glory known to the objects of his mercy, whom he prepared in advance for glory? Even us, whom he also called, not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles. In other words, those who are saved in God can understand the extent of his mercy that he chose us and not everyone. Okay? I'm going to leave that right there. Because I think you can see that those who are more of an Arminian bent, who would say that it is free will, I've given you the verses that they would use to defend that. And I don't deny those verses. I'm not saying they're wrong. You know, what sense does it make for Jesus say, to say, go into all the earth and you know preach the gospel and you know, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit if preaching didn't make a difference. So I have a lot of humility about this, even though I'm a Reformed theologian. But I also read things like this and the others which say, God, before the creation of the world, had already decided who he was going to elect for salvation. And that some were chosen for his wrath. It does say that, right? Yes. Yes. Uh, well, I, I, it's, I like the way you presented it because you kind of gave two sides. Mm -hmm. um, but in everything that you presented, and I was looking very carefully, I couldn't see why there isn't the, another option that some are predestined and some are left for, to choose of their own free will to go forward. So a third option. Well, none of the verses give that option. No, I just, uh, but I, neither one of them said that wasn't it. And none of them presented that it wasn't also an option. That's true. I mean, they don't say, and by the way, there's no other choice. <laughs> well, and yet they do They do present, you know, either this or this. They do, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the scripture, the, the verses do. do not and so it, it's a pretty, it, it's quite an extrapolation to say there might be a third choice when there's no scripture support for the idea that it's either elect or not, or it's either free will or it's not. But if, if, it said, if part of the argument says there can be free will, Nobody said that's absolutely wrong. Right. And and also there's there's a predestination, mm -hmm. and nobody said that's either absolutely right or wrong. It leaves open the option if one thinks about it that some people are chosen, and that's those that are reelected. And it's also up to others who may not know if they're chosen or not 
to, to try their best to uh, believe and have faith and, and obtain the grace. Uh, so some are elect to salvation, some are elect to damnation, and some have a choice? <laughs> I, I would think that's possible. Okay. Uh, well, there is some way that this fits together, because it's all in Scripture, and we believe it's true. Mm -hmm. But there is a challenge to that. John, you had your hand up? Um, one of your instructors, J.I. Packer, wrote a book called Evangelism. And in this little book, he deals with this issue. The, the, the truth between between uh, divine providence, predestination, and the choice of free will. And he uses a word that I maybe you can remember where I cannot remember. I, I never get this word right. It's antinomia or antinomianism. Antinomianism, which basically says it's not a contradiction, but what he says in his book is this: when you are faced with two truths that are opposite to one another, yet they stand on their own merits and support and are supported by biblical truth. If you make a choice between one and the other, the only way you can make a choice between one or the other is to be dishonest with the text. Because right. they are both supported by truth. Right. So his whole purpose in that book was to say, when you're faced with these, and the Bible has many of those, um, the only option we have is to believe them both. Yeah, that's, that's right. exactly yeah. what J.I. Packer said. Well, and I talked before about paradox. See, the difference, paradox and contradiction, not the same thing. A contradiction is when two things are contrary to one another in such a way that they can't, you know, that they, they oppose one another. Like saying Jesus is the divine Son of God, Jesus is not the divine Son of God. That's a contradiction. They can't both be true. In fact, it violates the second law of logic, which is the law of non-contradiction. Something cannot be both A and not A. Something cannot be both true and untrue, which is why everybody can't be right, by the way. <coughs> it defies the basic laws of thought or logic. But there is such a thing as a paradox. A paradox is when we have two truths, and we don't understand how both of those truths, they don't contradict each other directly, but we don't understand how both of them can be true. And yet, we can accept that they are both true. Jesus is fully God and fully man. How do you be 100% of two different things? And yet, we believe it's true. We don't understand it. The reason why is, is in all humility, there is a limit to human intellect. There is a limit to human uh, language, our ability to articulate. See, we, we can't think of something we can't articulate. Really. Ultimately. I mean, unless you're the very highest level of theoretical math. And so... I think that what we have here is a paradox. That we believe both of these things are true. They are in Scripture. And I read the free will passages and I say, absolutely, that's why I preach. And I read the, you know, the election passages and I say, praise to God that He has allowed me to be one of the elect. And so I accept both of those things. And that's what J. A. Becker being a wise man, that's where he was coming from. And that's why I said we have to have humility. And that's why I present this saying, I'm not going to tell you one's right and one's wrong. Okay, first. Um, yes, Ken. Yeah, I, you know, I grew up with the Armenian point of view, and as especially in the last ten years, I've, I've been moving very rapidly to the point of I had to accept them both. I don't understand how they fit together. The true Armenian view would say if we don't have a choice, God can't be just. But that's with our understanding, and exactly. God is greater than our understanding. But you look at the fact that. We cannot, our, we cannot cause ourselves to rise from spiritual death. That's, we cannot that's do the total it. depravity it, part. It has, to, it has to be a work of God. And when you look at the fact that everything good in us is a work of God, then you're like, okay. <laughs> right. I just got to believe in both and believe that God is just, that He's good, and that I can't understand it all, but I just want to accept right. every bit of His grace that He has. But we I mean, do need to know enough about it to be right. able to understand what the issues are. Did, right. you, did you have your hand up? Or? Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to come to you, but let's let our... A lot of pressure. And I'll come back to, to John. <coughs> Army? Yeah, okay. your art. <laughs> well, <clears throat> in this kind of uh, allegation, it is my mind was falling short. Yeah. 
It's not the Bible, it's not the Lord. And my mind falls short because I take a little bit of here and I want to make it the whole thing and it's not. Mm -hmm. I take a little bit here and I want to make it the whole thing and it's not. Now, I have two verses here that help me understand this thing. I am in Second Peter. The Lord, Second Peter 2.9 the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to preserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. Now, I am now on uh, 2 Peter three nine. The Lord is not a slack concerning his promise as some men count to slackness. But it's a long suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. Mm -hmm. I don't have a problem with that. Right. Well, yeah, I mean the, the first the first passage you read from Peter says God knows what he's doing. And we don't completely. Yeah. And that's why I said we have to have some yield, some humility about this. But it doesn't mean that we put on blinders and say, I'm only going to read the verses, or I'm only going to remember the verses, or I'm only think about the verses that agree with what I want them to say, whether it be free will or election. It's all God's truth, and so we're going to look at it all, even though we have to have some humility and know, yeah. and say, we don't understand how it all fits that, together. That's why I said I really like when you gave both yeah. views, to the you know, you're going you're gonna to be faced with them in your right. life and your thinking and your conversation. Yeah, and, and I'm a, I, again, I'm, I consider myself a Reformed theologian, and yet I have humility about that. In some ways, I'm a little more Lutheran than I, I am Calvinist, because, and I'll get to something in just a minute where I, where I think that's the case. John? I was just going to follow up. I was just going to follow up by saying that J.I. Packer, this brilliant theologian who's very prolific, ends up with the conclusion, embrace the mystery. Yeah. Are the great theologians all... I mean, it's like Karl Barth when he was lecturing in the U.S. and somebody asked him the greatest truth that he'd ever encountered. And, his, and, and he was the number, probably the premier theologian of the 20th century. He said the most important theological point was, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells us. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Marvin? And then we'll get, we need to finish here. Probably going to say the same thing has been said, but just in a little different direction. Even God doesn't have total free will in so much as he limits himself that he will not create evil or he will not sin. Man doesn't have, man has limited free will too. We can't fly, we can't go through walls, we can't uh, hear things from the other. Unless you're Superman. <laughs> <Right. laughs> you can That's control it. You know, and, uh, but, and we have limited knowledge and limited skill and we're limited by where we're born and how we're raised and all these kind of things. And I, I think ultimately the biggest limitation to our free will is to not be able to fully understand what God's doing. Mm -hmm. And that was the biggest talking block for me for a long time. Like right. I said, as like you said, believe what, what you know and don't fuss about the rest. If yeah. you can't figure it out, keep on going. Don't let what you don't understand overwhelm what you do understand. Okay? Uh, and we do understand these things are mysteries. We believe they are all true. The point is, do we have some humility about that? Yeah, that's it. And we're right. able to say, I don't, we don't have all the answers. Okay, you just experienced somebody who, who, I believe it's fair to call myself a theologian, a theologian who says, I don't understand it all. Okay, that's, I don't know if you know it, but that's fairly rare. <laughs> J.I. Packer being an exception to that, and, and J.I. Packer was one of my professors. Uh, I, I actually did a workshop with him, eight students in J.I. Packer, studying Calvin's Institutes. You know, so we get fairly close on that. I remember he told me that if I would learn um, I was talking about wanting to learn Latin. He said, if you learn Latin, it will clarify your thinking, because Latin is so succinct. Anyway, okay, I want to look at one other issue with regard, again, we're talking about this with regard to salvation. How do we access it? Is it purely by sovereign election, or is it by free will? There's some of both of that in there. The point is believe, okay? That's the point, believe. Um, the, some, of the, some of the beyond of that, we don't fully understand. The other question that I want to raise, and this is something I spent quite a bit of, quite a bit of effort because it was a question that was raised in Bible studies, um, and that is, once you are saved, are you always saved? Once saved, always saved. That is a tenet of Reformed theology. That that those who are elect can't not be saved, 
And so therefore they can't be unsaved. Now this is one of the points that Calvin and Luther disagreed on. Luther believed in, in the perpetuation of salvation you know, for, for those who were elect. You know, and Luther did have a, a version of election. It wasn't just Calvin. Um, and yet he believed that it was possible for us to renounce that. And I come down with Luther on that one. But I want to give you two, a number of scriptures which argue both sides of this. And that is, and I put it in the terms of, is our salvation irrevocable? Meaning once we're saved that we can't, it can't be revoked. We can't lose it. All right? And this is an issue that denominations disagree with. Protestant denominations disagree about. Is our salvation irrevocable? Here are verses that say that, yes, once you're saved, you can't be unsaved. John 10, my sheep listen to my voice, I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Romans 8, 38, 39. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor any powers, Neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Pretty con conclusive list. Nothing can separate you from Jesus Christ once you are in His in faith in Him. 1 John 2. Dear children, this is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us, and their going showed that none of them belonged to us. What John is saying there is that some of the people who have been Christians, one of us, left the faith and became problems. And he's saying, if they had really belonged to us, really, then they would have remained with us. The fact that they left means they never really had faith. This is saying, you don't lose your faith. If you do, you never really had it in the first place. Now, here are some verses that say, is our salvation irrevocable? Can we lose it? The answer is no. It's not irrevocable. We can lose it. Matthew 10, 21, 22. Brothers will betray brother to death and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. All men will hate me because will hate you because of me. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. Which clearly implies that some will not stand firm to the end and will not be saved, right? Mm -hmm. Matthew 10, 32, 33. These are, this is Jesus talking here, these two first two. Whoever acknowledges me before men, I will acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before men, I will disown him before my Father in heaven. 1 Corinthians 9, Therefore I do not run like a man running aimlessly, I do not fight like a man beating the air, no, I beat my body and make it a slave, so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Paul is saying, I have to maintain discipline myself so that I don't disqualify myself. The prize is salvation. Okay, other verses about whether or not salvation is irrevocable, these seem to say, no, it's not irrevocable, you can lose it. 1 Corinthians 15. Dear brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved if, and I put the underline in there, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. Colossians 1, 22 and 23. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation if you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. If you hold out. Hebrews 3, 6-14. See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart. Actually, this should be 12 to 16. 12 to 14, that, that passage is wrong. See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ if we hold firmly till the end the confidence we had at first. Hebrews 6, 4 to 6. It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the coming age. Sounds like Christians, right? 
if they fall away, saying it is impossible, if they fall away to be brought back to repentance, because to their loss they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting Him to public disgrace. One more passage, and then I'll explain to you what I think this is all saying. Hebrews 6, 4-6. Uh, wait, that's what I just read. If they fall away. I don't know why I had that up there twice. Okay. I believe, and I, I figured this out for myself, and then I found out this is what Luther believes, so good on Luther. Um, there is nothing that can tear you away from Jesus Christ. There is no sin that you can commit. There is no... And that's why it says neither height nor depth can remove you from the grace of Jesus Christ. Nothing can take you out of Jesus Christ, the faith in Jesus Christ or destroy that, but you can throw it away. So you cannot, by accident, by sin, by whatever, fall out of faith in Jesus Christ to the extent that you will, are no longer saved, but it is possible for you to publicly renounce the faith. Okay? That to say, I don't believe that anymore, I, I don't believe in Jesus, I renounce all of that. You can throw it away, but you can't lose it. You see the difference in that? That to me is how these verses fit together. That you will not lose your faith, even if you sin, you'll be for, you can be forgiven of those sins, you are still in Christ, but you can publicly renounce your faith and, and you know, it said that, uh, let me look over here, Whoever disowns me before men, I will disown him before my Father in heaven. Okay? We can publicly deny the faith in Christ, and I believe then lose our salvation. That's, that's how I think these verses fit together. And Luther said that. Yes? Doesn't this all go back to the heart again? Because Peter um, said three times he, just, he, he didn't know Christ. But in the heart, he, he still had the love and everything. I mean, well, but he, he had denied Christ, so we don't know what would have happened to him, but he later came back to Jesus. I mean, when Jesus appeared to them on the Sea of Galilee, the scene where Jesus says to Peter, do you love me? And Peter said, you know I love you. And Jesus said again, do you love me? Well, you know I love you. And then Jesus said again, do, Peter, do you love me? Now, every time Jesus is using the word, do you agape, the divine love? Do you love me completely? And Peter said, you know what, phileo you. I, I love you like a brother. Not the same thing. And then at the end, after he asked him the third time, do you agape me? Peter says, Lord, you know all things, and you know that I agape. I love you completely. I love you with a divine love. And then Peter was reconciled. If Peter had not come back to the Lord, if he had not been reconciled to the Lord, these verses would suggest he would have been damned because he had publicly, publicly denied Jesus. He had disowned Jesus before men. So Jesus just seems to say he would dis, Jesus would have disowned him before the Father in heaven. Now, um, people get hung up on one of the most difficult passages in the New Testament is, all sins are forgivable except the sin of blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. There are people who that verse, who think they've committed blasphemy of the Holy Spirit and they can never be forgiven again. Well, I believe blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is to deny the truth that the Holy Spirit tells you. When the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart and says, Jesus Christ is the Son of God and you should accept Him, and you say, no, even though you know it's true, you are blaspheming against the Holy Spirit because you're calling Him a liar. And that is an unforgivable sin. In effect, it's the same thing as saying when you deny Christ, who the Holy Spirit has told you is, is who He said He is. The thing about the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, though, is you can, you can renounce that blasphemy. You can say, I, I'm, I was wrong, forgive me for that. I do believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. He is Lord. I believe He was raised from the dead. And then you're no longer guilty of the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. That, I think, is in effect what happened to Peter, is that when he... Came when he admitted his love for Jesus and came back into fellowship with Jesus Christ, he no longer was guilty of the sin of denying Christ, even though the Holy Spirit had made it clear to him that Jesus was who he said he was. Okay? Marvin? Peter said it so well. You know all things. Exactly. I love you. And so it's back to the same as the other argument. God is never going to be surprised by what happens by us. Right. He knows. His side of it is taken care of. I think it's, we're working on our side to try to 
work and to do and live the way that he wants us to. And, and that's the encouragement that we have. But at the same time, in the back of our mind, we know that he's in control of all. Yeah. And, I'll, and one thing before. The, fundamentally, we have to understand we're dealing with God here. Yeah. And we're not going to be able to take it all in. We're not going to understand it all. But we have to work at it. Yes. Well, and, and Jesus knew it too because he said to Peter, Satan is going to sift you like wheat. Yeah. But when you return, strengthen your brothers. Yep. He knew he was going to return. <laughs> right. Absolutely, he did. And he told, you know, Peter said, I will never deny you. He's, he's going to pray for him. I'm oh, praying Peter. for him. <laughs> you'll deny me three times. <laughs> yeah. Chris. Uh, in standard Reformed theology, I just, I'm just trying to... Are you correcting my Reformed theology? No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm really trying to learn about it. Sure. Um, yeah. um, it would, the, the, if somebody who sort of rejects who, who was, quote, saved, and, and then walks away from it, rejects it, Standard Reformed theology would say he was never saved in the first place. Correct. correct. Okay. They would use the passage that John, from John, John being, they wouldn't say it's the only passage, but that's the one that you know, it's at most that says, they went out from us, and that proved they were never really part of us because if they went out from us, the fact that they went out from us proved they never really belonged here in the first place. They never really believed in the first place. That is the Reformed response to all of that. So that means that in the, the Reformed mind, that person wasn't elected in the first place. Correct. Okay. Yeah, they, they, for whatever reason, said they were, but they weren't really. John? When I look at this, I see, I see a real admonition to, to guard your steps. That, that this is not, uh, you don't take your salvation as something for granted. And, and these people, you know, who fell away, they didn't just wake up one day and say, you know, I think I'm going to rebel against God. I think I'm just going to throw them in the towel. Right. It began with, with entertaining these, these somewhat benign thoughts. Almost certainly they got what they thought was a better offer. Yeah. And, and, and it leads them slowly down a path that until one day, they didn't lose their salvation. They just gave it away, like right. you said. Yeah. Well, and as it, I'm, I say I'm a Reformed theologian. I'm not a very orthodox Reformed theologian <laughs> because, again, I think I agree that this part about that you can throw your faith away, as I say, Luther said that, that we are assured of our salvation, but we still have the choice to be able to throw it away. Um, Calvin did not say that. You know, the Reformed theology didn't say that. And so, and I don't... It's not like I try to pick and choose what I like, but I try to be honest with what Scripture says. And, and I don't, Calvin wasn't perfect either. You know, that's it's, it's not all it's not all perfect. And so there are some things I don't agree with. And there's some things I hold in balance, like free will and and election. Ultimately, God is in control of everything. How much we are choosing is involved in that is interwoven with God's you know God's providential control of all the universe, that's the mystery. Where is the intersections? That's the mysterious part. I don't deny sovereign election, because Scripture, I believe, plainly says it's there. I don't deny that there's some aspect of free will, because Scripture clearly says there's some aspect of free will. How those two things are interwoven is, to me, a mystery. And those who say, they got it absolutely figured out, I'm going to go, yeah, right. <laughs> no, good, good on you. Okay. Well, one person I, I look at when I view this as I go back and look at King Saul. King Saul was anointed as the king. He was anointed and received the, the spirit. And then Saul became proud. He rejected and, and eventually it said the, the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and an evil, evil spirit, spirit came. And you know not that you can that's a perfect parallel. But it's definitely something that ought to get your attention. Yeah. Okay, any questions? Last questions. I hope this has been helpful to you um, in terms of understanding the nature of salvation, how it's been viewed, and how we access it. And yeah, there's not perfect answers for all of it, but at least you know what the terms are. At least you sort of know what the, what the issues and discussions are. And I will see you in three weeks. Not next week, not the following week, but the week after that. And I'm sorry for that. We will see you then.